What's up, good people? It's your boy, Leroy McKenzie Jr. It's another author showcase episode, episode 64, coming to you, brought to you by brought to you by the National Black Unity News and JNF Enterprises. We want to thank y'all for tuning in. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Well, oh, there was the echo, but we are good now. <laughs> yeah. But we want to thank you for tuning in. The author showcase brought to you by the National Black Unity News and JNF Enterprises. It is great to be here with you all again. And we want to appreciate you all tuning in. We appreciate you all uh, being a part of the National Black Unity News and what we're doing and what we try to do because we're in the community, about the community and for the community. So we thank you all for tuning in. And tonight, tonight, tonight is no different than any other uh, evening that we have where we want to bring you some of our uh, some of our countries and nations, great authors, writers, and those who are making a difference in and through the community. Um, and are passionate about their, their writings, their books, where they come and they talk to us just a little bit to have a conversation about their mission, their message, their, their movement, their motivation, all of those great things uh, who, that is about them. And we take you just a little bit behind the curtain, as I call it, so that you can learn a little bit about who they are. You can support them uh, in, in purchasing their books and actually learn. They have some great knowledge some great information and resources that they provide uh, to us for us uh, in the uh, in their in their particular books that they bring to us. And tonight is no different. And for those of you that are a part of Baltimore, I think you all may be familiar with this uh, this young man who I'm going to be having a conversation with tonight. Uh, and it is none other than Mr. B More News himself but also author, entrepreneur, um, Mr. Donnie Glover. Uh, brother Donnie, thank you for joining me tonight. How you doing? I'm grateful, big brother. How are you? Oh, big brother. I appreciate that. <laughs> you get to ask the questions tonight, so I guess I'm in the, I'm in the passenger seat. Exactly. You're in the passenger seat tonight, so you get to kind of kind of answer some questions as opposed to as opposed to answer some questions. But what, what I'd like to do, actually, is uh, if we could, we'll, we'll start off by you just telling uh, folks a little bit about who you are, who Donnie Glover is, what you do, and then we'll get into our conversation about, you know, about your book and then everything else about you, if you can. Well, 27 years ago, I started off as a journalist for the Sandtown Winchester Viewpoint. I went from there around 2002, I started bemorenews.com. I was found myself doing something that I love to do, which is writing mm -hmm. and making money and selling advertisements. Mm -hmm. Like you got all in the back of there, mm -hmm. all behind you. Um, and that merged, so there's, there's media, there's business, and, and I probably would have to start with having grown up in a family-owned business. My father was a funeral director and mortician. He and my mom owned Glover's Funeral Chapel. They had three consecutive businesses, one around 68 Patterson Park and Lanville, one around 71. 712, 714 East North Avenue. That's in between Boone and Homewood. And then the third one, uh, the last one was over at 802 Madison Avenue, right off of MLK. So media, business, growing up in a family business. And so Black Wall Street, as I learned about it, first learned about it 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I came to realize how in essence, I grew up on Black Wall Street. Right. I grew up around Black business owners. Uh, I grew up seeing Black businesses 
from A to Z, whether it was in the funeral business, whether it was limousines, whether it was the florists, whether it was beauty salons, the barber shop. I grew up in a black business ecology. Now, let me now how let me ask you this: How important was that with you growing up around that entrepreneurial um, uh, family? Do you think that that was what directed you to to you know to kind of start your own well to be in your own business? And then, um, did you what, did you take up journalism because that was you said you like to write? But was journalism that venue that you that you um, would eventually? find yourself kind of saying, wow, this is something that I, I think I could do for, you know, for, for my career and, and even for my business? Well, let me, I, I think you want to ask me, why didn't I go into the funeral business? Well, yeah, well, that too, that too. I mean, because that, that's an interesting question because a lot of times those who are uh, children of entrepreneurs don't necessarily go into the business. So what was that like? Were you pressured into it? or initially pressured to go into the business or they were just like, no, you do you, you know, and everything like that. Well, in a family business, many would agree that if you're old enough to participate, then there's a role for you, whether it's answering the phone. Mm -hmm. That was probably my first assignment. Good evening, Glover's Funeral Chapel. As I got older, it may have been sitting at the front desk. But what I knew in my gut and my heart of hearts is that I don't like the smell of dead bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will tell you that that one thing alone stopped me from being a funeral director because in order to be a funeral director in the state of Maryland, you also have to be a mortician. In order to be right. a mortician, you have to embalm, I'm not sure what it is, maybe 200 bodies. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the smell of dead bodies, not one dead body. Now. I helped my dad uh, until he went home to glory back in 2003. So all my life up until that point, I had worked in his business. I had worked for him. I did whatever was necessary. Interesting job I had was collections. You ever try to collect money from a family with a body <laughs> already buried? I know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 not easy at all. No. Nah. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine and, and having to make those kinds of phone calls, you know. No, I wasn't making a phone call. It's just oh. how do you get your money when the body's already in the ground? In the ground. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the fa a lot of families might be, well, hey, the job is already done. What you going to do? Go, go pull it back up? There's something you can do, but you don't want to do that because mm. you want to maintain your professionalism. Cool. And I guess I guess maybe you learned that some people you just can't deal with. But I've, mm -hmm. I will tell you this. I've seen my dad and other funeral directors uh, do favors for many Black families, many. Right. Right. And whether they are appreciated, were appreciated, I can't answer that. But I can tell you, I've seen the Black funeral directors in Baltimore in particular, a very uh, special group of people. Uh, many of them belong to the Funeral Directors and Morticians Association of Maryland. I can tell you that they are one very special group of people. Mm -hmm. They are charged with taking care of the home going services of community members. And the ones that I grew up around, the ones I grew up knowing, the ones whose children I grew up with understand uh, the caliber of service that is demanded, that is required. And if you're not going to do it, then you need to step up. But it's it's more than just a job. It's more of a uh, a sacred responsibility. You're taking mm -hmm. care of someone's loved ones yeah. in their final service. And uh, it is very important to do it correctly and with class and dignity. Exactly. Exactly. And, and and that's the thing, doing it with class and dignity, I think, is the, is the big part of that. Now. Now, you said you did that with your, you said you were in the family business until your, your father passed away. Um, when was it that you decided to, to do um, the journalism and, and the bemorenews.com and you said, wow, this is something that I think that, that, that Black folks need? 
Well, it started at Morehouse in 83. Around 93, uh, after rip racing and running the streets and being as bad as I thought I could be, <laughs> learning some lessons, getting my hind parts whipped by the streets, mm. my father and I made an agreement that he would pay for me to go back to school. And that school would end up being Coppin State, which okay. was actually my seventh school. Uh, albeit, and the closest one to my house. You could have never told me in a million years I was going to Coppin, especially not after Morehouse. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. But I got to Coppin the first semester. I ended up uh, earning two, uh, one scholarship and not long after a second, two honor scholarships. And so Pops only had to pay for that first semester. After I got in the door, I was mm -hmm. clocking scholarships like they were going out of style. And it's nothing like getting that rebate check that you can go shopping with because I do like to go shopping. I like to buy the really nice leather leather coats. At least I did back in college. It was very important to me. Now, was your major journalism? Did you did you major in journalism? At, English um, at media arts, broadcast production and technology, under the professorship of Ron Nichols out in, uh, from St. Louis, and uh, he taught us. Uh, the very best he gave us. Matter of fact, the first assignment was to watch uh, The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Mm -hmm. Griffith. And I write about it in my current book, I Am Black Wall Street. Uh, the second assignment was to read Megatrends by John Naisbitt. J Megatrends was looking at the world, specifically Asia. Uh, and then we later had to read Megatrends 2000. And, and Naisbit was looking at the Southeast Basin, i.e. Uh, China, Hong Kong, Japan, as the new nexus of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And I later wrote it in my graduate, in graduate work over Morgan in International Studies, how China would be the new hegemon. I wrote that back around 96. Mm. Mm. If you recall, Hong Kong went back under Chinese rule in 97. Okay. And many uh, writers from the West concluded or precluded that uh, China would destroy Hong Kong when nothing could be further from the truth. The West never wants to acknowledge yeah. anybody non West. Yeah. Uh, but the fact is, China has been uh, yeah. in existence for thousands of years Chinese civilization mm -hmm. has been you know continuous maybe one of the most continuous civilizations on earth wow. America is what 200 years old right right 250 right. years old we we young bucks exactly <laughs> we're, we're, we're babies yeah yeah compared as a, to other as a nation yeah yeah, and, and and you're such a historian, and I love that because you're such a history. Now, have you always had that love for history and and that affinity for for you know for doing what you you know doing what you do and and know because you you roll off stuff that I'd be like, wow, I I was like, I ain't know it. I'm not a I'm not a history buff like you, but that's that's what I, I, I when I when I have conversations with you and I've had conversations with you, you have so much knowledge about history, and not just American history. This is like you just said. This is this is global history that that folks don't seem to. I mean that you that you seem to have a really good um, grasp of, and that you just really. I mean you. It's not like you you just like you said you 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 you're talking about stuff that you studied in school. So this is stuff that stayed with you for years and years and years, and and I think that that's what I appreciate about you. And what you talk about that, and and we'll get into that when we talk about Black Wall Street too. Now, what got you started? Because this Black Wall Street isn't your first book. What got you started in in wanting to go from doing journalism and and having the black um, the the um, having the the media company to saying, wow, I think I want to write a book. Where did that Where did that come from? Well, like many of us out there, I've run across a bully or two in my life. <laughs> okay uh-huh and this one particular bully is named david miller mm, yes <laughs> david miller has about 14 books out yep <laughs> and he, he would not stop beating me up until i finished my first book i mean i don't know any <laughs> other way to tell you <laughs> oh that's funny that's funny yeah but... unapologetically black that was the first yes. book that was yes. 2015 came out in the middle of Freddie Gray 
And, and I mm-hmm. say that jokingly, but uh, you, as you well know, you better get the inspiration from wherever you can. Mm-hmm. And when it's somebody of a caliber of a David Miller, yeah. you come to eventually realize that you've been blessed mm-hmm. to have such a person in your life. And there's also Pam Reeves and Deborah Hardnett and, and you, uh, particularly with this second book. And what I'm getting to is the team, the team, Marcus Murchison, God for, forgive me, Billy Murphy, yeah. uh, the team yeah. that you have to have, not only to do a book, but anything, especially entrepreneurial, you need a team, you need a graphics person, big ups to uh, Plan B, Brother Fame. He did the cover. Okay. You, need, um, you need people. No man is an island. You, you need if you're going to do something epic, you need a team, and and let them do what they do. I told her, I told the graphic designer what I wanted, mm-hmm. and then I left it alone. You take it. You know, some of us we want to. Oh no, move this. <laughs> that, that. Let people do what they do. That's my philosophy. Yeah. yeah. You give somebody the vision, just like with my websites. Uh, I tell a web designer what I want, what you want. Mm-hmm. to the best, you know, to the best of my ability. And then you let it go. Mm-hmm. You let them do what they do. That's that's and that's important. I love that. I love that that you that you um that you talk about that because your team and, and everybody has to understand the role that they play in it and, and doing what they do. Now, what was the I'm actually, what was the writing experience like for you in writing Black Wall Street? How was that? Putting that information that you gathered and then that information that I know that you, that you one, you probably knew about, but then that you wanted to actually structure. How was that experience for you, um, that, that writing experience for you? I was told never to say the word overwhelming, but it was as close to overwhelming as I could get. In, in other words, the more I dug, I wanted to look at, there are plenty of books already on Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Black Wall Street. I wasn't, I never set out to rewrite Hannibal Johnson, others, they already got books on Black Wall Street. I wanted to know, how did they get there? Where did they come from? Because there were no Black people. And so the story, the history, I mean, I had to go back. Can we get into the book a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. After digging and digging and researching, he had two facts. He had three facts. One, the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, a.k.a. Black Wall Street, was one of 70 to 80 Black communities in Oklahoma. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was, after, after watching um, the documentary, yes, I, I, I was aware of that. So, so the Greenwood District was not the first. Mm-hmm. So that alone took some time. There were 80 different communities, including Langston and Bowley. Bowley is still going on today. Okay, okay. Um, Texas right next door to Oklahoma. Uh-huh. Texas has over 500, they had over 500 black communities. Wow. I'm hearing some music, is somebody playing? Yeah, I hear that too. I, that, that's not in my background, is it? I, I don't know if that's your background or not. No, it's not me. Yeah, because it's only you and it's only you and I on here. Okay. I don't so hear it. I don't hear it now. Go ahead. Um Hey Donnie. Oh yeah, did you have something in your background? <laughs> yeah, well let me go out and come back and I apologize. Okay, no problem. No problem. So while he's while he's going out um and, and coming back in, but he's gonna uh, we're gonna get into his book. Uh, I am Black Wall Street. We'll talk about the, we're getting into the um, the history of the, uh, of his book and, and kind of like what he, what he talks about in the, uh, in his book. 
Now, most of you may not know um, about how Black Wall Street got started. And that's what he talks about in his book. It's not, um, it's not the current, you know, the, the stories that we always hear about uh, Black Wall Street and understanding Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is actually what uh, I believe, what, and we'll get into this, what he actually has or what he discusses in his book is, like he said, before he um, had to pop out and then pop back in, was how did they get there? because the people uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma did not just get there, you know? So, oh, okay, he's back. So Don, you wanna, you wanna talk about uh, that, talk about that, what you were saying about Texas and having, having the, you're on mute, Donnie, you're on mute. Yeah, so I wanted to know how those black people got to Oklahoma in the first place, because there was nobody out there. And mind you, uh, so let me give you one more fact. I told you about the 80, 70 to 80 black communities in Oklahoma, I told uh -huh. you about some 500 in Texas. Now all of that is post civil war. Mm -hmm. But when, when I completed the research, I found that the first black hero in Oklahoma came out of Florida. Right. Now, did you know that Florida was not an original colony. Absolutely right. I remember you telling me that, right. And that's part of what you discussed, right, absolutely. Spain owned Florida, it was called Spanish Florida mm -hmm. until 1831. Who's doing the $20 bill? His name Andrew. Andrew Jackson was, was the American soldier that went down into Florida because if you were black, from Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, and you got to Florida, you could get your freedom. You mm -hmm. had to agree to fight for the militia and you'd have to convert to Catholicism. Again, this is Spanish Florida. Right. They also pushed a lot of Indians to Florida. And so the word Seminole is not right. an actual tribe. Seminole is the name assigned to all of the Indians that landed in Florida who were fleeing the white uh, invaders that had come on to you know, the Eastern shore okay. of America, okay. the Eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. So over time, Florida had a bunch of blacks and a lot of Indians. There's a lot of history in Florida. Let me tell you, I write it in the book. When George Zimmerman did what he did to, to Trayvon and they let him go, I swore never to go to Florida again in my life. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But once I started researching this book and learning all of the nuggets of history, phenomenal black history in Florida, I, I could actually live there now. Mm. Let me give you a tidbit. It's in this book. Have you ever heard of black pirates, Leroy? Black pirate? No, no. That's why you got to get the book. Well, exactly, exactly. There mm -hmm. were black pirates. Okay, okay. Including Black Caesar. Mm. So Black and Caesar isn't just the movie. Told, according to my research, Black Caesar was the first black millionaire in America. Oh, wow. Okay. He had a stash with six million in silver. Uh huh. Now, I don't know that he ever got to spend it because they hung him in Virginia. Mm -hmm. But the hero that came out of Florida was a black Indian. Mm -hmm. Do you have any Indian blood in your family? No, not that I'm not that I'm aware of um, on either side. No. Do you and know any side. black people who do? Uh, not off the top of my head, I don't. But you know, uh, a lot maybe, of folks maybe, don't maybe. have that I know haven't traced their, their history back. You know that that was that. Maybe I'm just unique, but I've met a lot of black people that got some type of Indian in their blood on uh -huh. my on my father's side. His grandmother. Maternal grandmother was Blackfoot Indian. Okay. And on my mother's side, her father was from San Juan, Puerto Rico. He was Barriqua, mm, okay. Taino Indians. Mm -hmm. So that points to another thing I discussed in my book. According to Western scholars, Blacks came to America. Blacks first came to, the, to America in the bottom of a slave ship. 
Mm-hmm. And this book will 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 smack that all out the park. Okay. We'll dismiss it with the swiftness. Mm-hmm. First of all, the first black man that I found in modern times, so the past three four hundred years. Okay. So there's a couple of stories. One is Juan Garrido. Juan Garrido. Another one is called Estefan or or Little Stephen. And both men were explorers. Okay. Uh, Okay. Juan Garrido was actually a conquistador. Okay. Now, this is a very important part of the story that I don't want you to miss. Columbus comes to America in what year? It was uh, 1492. 1492. And he had blacks showing him the way across the Atlantic. Correct. 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 Don't you kind of wonder, like, <laughs> did they notice? Did they already notice? And, right. and I'm about to tell you, yes, they already knew this because they had been traveling. And and where you want to look is Spain. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of the Moors? Yes. Mm-hmm. The Moors ruled Spain up until 1492. Got you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So all Columbus did, he saw them black people. They've been watching black people in the ships. The Moors who dominated the Iberian Peninsula for some 700 years. Mm-hmm. That includes what Spain, uh, Portugal, you know, all of that. Moors were royalty across Europe, from Habsburg, Austria, to Ireland, to Germany. If you if you Google Moors and coat of arms, you'll see a, a Moorish crest for most every European nation. Okay. So that tells us that the Moors who had dominated so much of Europe for 700 years, who taught them bathing, who built some of the first universities, that these were world travelers. And they had already been in the ships and they had already been to the Americas. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of puts slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, into better perspective. Okay. Mm -hmm. But once that, you know, Columbus did his thing, then that whole new world slave exploration really went through the roof. I also want to share this. Slavery took off in South America at least a century before it did in North America. Okay, okay. So there's this project called the 1619 Project. Yes. Mm -hmm. The wrong date. That was not the first group of Blacks brought to America in captivity. It was more like 100 years earlier, around 1525. And those Blacks, they beat up the cat who was trying to make them slaves. And it's my belief, my understanding that those first slaves that went into South Carolina, they 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 ran off into the Gullah Islands. Mm. Mm. So this book about Tulsa and Greenwood in particular, which is a part of Tulsa, right? I look at that as a freedom colony. Okay. Okay. I look at the other 70 to 80 communities in Oklahoma as freedom colonies. Okay. I look at the Blacks that went to Texas, mm-hmm. who had established towns throughout East Texas as freedom colonies. What I also do is tell you the first freedom colonies in the Western Hemisphere. And that includes Venezuela. It includes Panama. And what I'm getting to, they were, free, they were freedom colonies because as slavery was being established, Mm -hmm. every black person out there in the world should know that black people didn't take the slavery line down. Mm -hmm. Everywhere there was slavery, there was bound to be an insurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. And the most famous insurrection in the Western Hemisphere is... Tell it. It's Haiti. Yep. They were the first to gain their independence. So everything you'll ever hear about Haiti in your lifetime is going to be something derogatory, something mean, something dirty, something ugly, to try to take something beautiful 
and make it ugly. But Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines uh, kicked Napoleon's hind parts mm -hmm. and sent him home crying. However, France has been blood-sucking Haiti ever since. Right, and that's what it's going to ask you really quick, you know, speaking of Haiti, because we know what's going on down there, that tell me, and you can tell me if you if you are aware of them, that Haiti to this day is still paying for that independence that they gained. Still paying um, child support. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. And, and that's, that is, um, that's a powerful thing. That's the nature of European powers. They <laughs> want to colonialize and blood suck because they produce nothing much of their own except war. Right, right, right. I mean, you right. look at how Africa was carved up, the Germans, the British, the, you know, the Portuguese, the Belgians, they did, a, they did a dastardly job on carving up Africa. If you know anything about Africa, uh, you know the only nation that was never colonized was Ethiopia. Mm. They were occupied a couple of years by Mussolini, but Ethiopia, that's where the fight is at. And I swear, Donnie, the only piece of history that I remember from high school was reading about what you just said, them sitting, I guess, I forgot what it was, sitting at a table the European, in Europe or whatever, and dividing up who was going to go where in Africa, who was going to take what parts of Africa. That's that's really like the only thing I remember in high school from from a, that American history that they you know that they tell. I'm like, wait a minute, they, they're sitting at a table dividing up Africa. And I'm gonna ask you this: Have have you noticed? And I might be crazy in the way that I'm thinking. The correlation in what is currently going on in Africa, them going to the Chinese being in Africa and all these other nations being in Africa and and um, pillaging it for its natural resources and our communities today here in the United States and, and our communities being pillaged the same way. Do you think that there's a correlation in that? Clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what European nations do. They pimp, mm -hmm. they exploit. Mm -hmm. And until the African, until the African-American stands up, and become self-sufficient, we're gonna be forever paying them. Wow. Well, now I want you to, and I, and, and I think you told, you, you, um, you actually write about this, but I, and I thought it was very important. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, I know you talked about Florida, but can you talk about the Trail of Tears and getting to um, Oklahoma? And, and Texas, how important that played, that part that that played in, in Black Wall Street. So there are two heroes highlighted in this book. For me, one is Chief John Horse, the Black Seminole chief mm -hmm. who fought in the second Seminole War. There were three Seminole Wars. The second one is in effect, the largest slave insurrection that ever happened in the United States. The Second Seminole War was the largest slave insurrection that ever happened in the United States and the most successful okay. because the Indians and the Blacks fought side by side. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the leader of the Blacks was Black Indian Chief John Horse. He had all kinds of names, Juan Cavallo, Gopher John, but he was a native of, of, of Florida. One of his parents was Indian, the other one was black. And he fought alongside the Indians, mm -hmm. the collection of Indians, the collection that we call the Seminoles, mm -hmm. which is a English translation of Cimarrones, the Spanish term. And that means wild ones, you know. Really? I told okay. you, wherever the Europeans went in to exploit, uh, you either fought, you died, you lived or you became a slave. Mm -hmm. And so the leader of the Blacks on the Trail of Tears, not all of them were slaves. Mm -hmm. They, Chief John Horse led his army. So they fought to a truce. The Second Seminole War ended when, when Chief John Horse told the cavalry, we will go to Oklahoma, 
but his 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 condition was that they would all get their freedom once they got there. Got there. Okay. Okay. The way we are taught the trail of tears is blacks was on their slaves. Period. End of story. Mm -hmm. And that's simply not the case. That's why you want to look up Chief John Horse. You want to get this book because Chief John Horse is the greatest black hero that I've ever read about. Wow. He led those families to Oklahoma. When they got out to Oklahoma, the U.S. government got jiggy with them. They reneged on their promise. Ooh. He then led 200 black families through Texas to Nascimento, Mexico. Wow. Establishing black towns all along the way. So really? Okay. The, and that was 1843 when he first went to Oklahoma. Okay. So when you look at what happened in Tulsa, you know, that didn't get established until 1906. Mm -hmm. 15 years later, they had burned down that Greenwood district of Tulsa. But I'm telling you that Blacks had been out there in Oklahoma for a good uh, 50, 60 years, establishing mm -hmm. Black towns, fighting with the Indians, because while there were some Indians that were okay with Black people, there were mm -hmm. other Indians that wanted to, you know, treat us as if we were slaves. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. again, I want to tell you, black people were fighting the entire way. Wow. It wasn't like you just came and put a chain around our neck. Some of us were kings. Some of us were princes. You know, whatever the case, black people ain't just taking line down. All throughout the Western Hemisphere, including Venezuela, Mexico, you know, you know, did you know there was a black president of Mexico? No, no, I didn't. Yeah, they what man, black people all over the world, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you think we want in Mexico? If you look at the Mayans, if you uh -huh. look at the artwork of the Mayans, they all got melanin, man. They ain't, right. they ain't white, they ain't light skin. That melanin, you ever heard of Luzia? Uh -uh. Luzia, L-U-Z-I-A. Her bones were found in a cave in Brazil. Mm. Brazil has the largest population of black people outside of Africa. Did you know that? Yes, I did. I did, I did know that. Yeah. I, you got 40 million blacks in the US. You got 100 million blacks in Brazil. In Brazil. Yeah. And yeah. Their, their freedom fighter was named Zumbi. Z-U-M-B-I. Zumbi. Zumbi dos pa Zumbi dos Palmares. Mm. He was a warlord, brother. He was a general. Mm. They just didn't take our people lying down, man. Our, our people were fighting, yeah. created maroon colonies. Uh, they, they got other names for them. Uh, but our people were fighting and establishing. Look at Jamaica. You ever been to Jamaica? No, I no, I haven't been yet, but yeah. On a $500 bill, they got Nanny the Maroon Queen. Mm. Nanny was another warrior, and she specialized in that machete. The mm. legend has it that the British soldiers come after Nanny and she flip her backside around, they shoot the bullets, and the bullets ricochet back and knock them to the ground. Wow. But she ended up getting her own territory. We fought, we got land. Mm -hmm. You don't fight, you become a slave. It's real simple. Yeah, yeah. And, and see, this is this is why I, I, I love what you do, Donnie, because you give us the rich, that rich history that, that nobody else is going to talk about and that nobody else talks about or, or readily knows. These are these are things that people just people need to know and understand because, like you said, I think a lot of us think that we just were locked up. You know, people just uh, they came and just put us in chains, and that we, you know, we were just like, okay, we'll become slaves. That wasn't it at all. You know, so tell tell me what you what do you want people to come? What do you want the readers to come away with? Um, after reading uh, the, your book, I Am Black Wall Street, what do you want that one that when they read that last page, what do you want them to come away with? I want them to understand why it's important to think for themselves. Mm. You ever heard of cognitive dissonance? Yes, yes, I, I have heard of it. <laughs> cognitive dissonance relates to someone who's been fed a lie the entire life. And when okay. the truth finally gets to them, they are. They wrestle mm. with their old beliefs. Like, I can't believe that. I, this, is tell, this is against everything that I was ever told. My people were slaves. I, you know, I mean, cognitive dissonance is coming to the realization that everything you were told about your people is a lie. Mm. 
There's a famous Harvard professor that says that only two to three percent of black people have indigenous blood. I can't believe him, and I don't care how rich, how famous, how well recorded he is. I just don't believe it. Let me tell you why. Okay. Because all you know about your history is what somebody else mm -hmm. who has no love for you has told you. Mm -hmm. So I want them to come away, Leroy, with a with a stronger sense of thinking for oneself. Whether you believe what's in here or not, think for yourself. Look up your, I also want people to look up their own family's history because you never know your, your grandmother, your great grandfather, they might have been millionaires. Mm -hmm. We, and, and let me tell you something else not all blacks were slaves, right? right. Not all black people were slaves, not all white people were free. Mm. It's interesting. You know, I live in Santa, and you know, one of the ongoing stories I report on are the non black addicts in my black community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One day out back, a non black addict was in the alley eating off the ground out of a bag. Mm -hmm. And I said, Hey, you better get out of my alley. And the non black addict yelled back, Excuse me, but do you own this alley? To which I responded, but by golly, I do. Now get the stepping. <laughs> and then the non-black addict proceeded to call me a effing N-word. Mm -hmm. This person had some cognitive dissonance mm. because all her life she's been told, told. That she's better than me, even mm. though she eating out my alley where my dog wouldn't eat. But that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a lot of misinformation and trauma. I'll never forget, this had to be 30 years ago, on a Donahue show. Remember the Donahue show, Phil yeah. Donahue? Mm -hmm. Phil Donahue had a white man, and they knew, they found out that his DNA, that he had black blood. Or oh, I've mm. seen another show, one of those similar shows, and and the kids found out that their mother had black blood and they wanted to disown the mother. That's how ridiculous racism is. If you disown your mother, how can you disown your mother because you think she's black? What that make you? <laughs> right, exactly. Mm. Now, now, what part does, and, and have you, and I'm sure you have, what do they call it? Um, uh, a critical race theory. Have, had you heard of that before this year? And, and can you explain a little bit about that? And does that correlate to, like you said, the cognitive dissonance? My understanding is that some people trying to rewrite history mm -hmm. and trying to pretty up the dirty stuff that's just dirty. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, that's what your ancestors did. And if you... If you think it was bad, then why are you still treating black people in a similar fashion today? Right, right. Why, why are we even having conversations about George Floyd and Trayvon Martin if that same mentality doesn't exist today? Okay. I think of the, the insurrection on January 6th. Mm -hmm. It goes right back to that Confederate loser mentality the confederates lost the war is over right 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 exactly exactly and just like back at the end of slavery 1865 when the ku klux klan was founded in pulaski tennessee they seemed like the very same people that were storming the capital on j6 mm. seemed like the same mentality, the mentality. yep and I, I've said the same thing. I've it's the, the same, same mentality. You lost. I mean, that's some serious mental illness, brother. Yeah, it, it, that really is. That that really is. And that's it. I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. And everybody knows that the biggest threat in America is violent white terrorists. Yep. Domestic terrorists. And, and the, they won't talk about that. Just like the Klan. 
Yeah. Yeah. Only difference now is they don't have to wear sheets because they judges, lawyers, doctors, college presidents, <laughs> exactly. CEOs. Yep. I was watching, and this is going back to one of your previous questions about America, the fight in America for black people, the fight in Africa. I was watching a television series called Deep State. And uh -huh. at the end of the day, Deep State was about carving up Africa modern day. Mm -hmm. A group of white men around the table, and they want to get cobalt, they want to get you know all of the minerals, what have you, out of the ground before China gets it out of Africa. And they would kill anybody, including their own mother, to do so. Mm. And so that's the kind of war that Africa is facing. Uh, it's bad enough people trying to bribe different people with money. Right. Um, and it's a shame that so many leaders take that money. And, and I get taking the money, but at some point, we have to become self-sufficient. Right. If I got diamonds in my earth, in my ground, I better learn how to get those diamonds to market without unnecessary intervention from people who have been stealing and sucking us dry for the past 300 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's the, the, I guess that's what I've, all, I've always thought about too. It's like, what, you know, what has to happen on that level, I guess, even in Africa, and even if you want to bring it here to our communities here, what is it that we have to do to change our mindset to understand Hey, this these are the things that we know we have to do, and that have to depend on someone else to come in and do it. Because as as me and a lot of my friends have been saying, I think you included, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody, but us. It, it's going to be up to us to develop what we need in order to be able to get to where where it is that we want to be able to get to. So. And let me just say to you that the African-American plays a critical role in the reestablishment of Africa. And I'm thinking the United States of Africa. Mm, mm. There are 54 countries there. Yep. It's time for the United States of Africa to form because the Europeans have formed, NATO has formed, you know, all these other entities have formed, and they're all about exploiting Africa. Yep. So it's, it's long overdue for the people of Africa from Algeria and Libya and Egypt up north down in Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, you know, on the east side, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea on the west side, Mauritania, Nigeria, and Niger need to come, Ghana need to come together and yeah. form, you know, remember Gaddafi was trying to form that currency. Right, but and again, I had heard about America that. was meddling with a, with a black president. Mm -hmm. Gaddafi got killed on Obama's watch. Right. But right. see, there, there are too many black people that want to distance ourselves from Africa. Why well, ain't African? Well, what else are you? Mm. You know, Jews in America connect to Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Irish Americans, they connect to Ireland. Chinese Americans connect to China. So where, where else do you think your black hand parts is supposed to connect to? They are looking for us. Black people in America represent the modern day Josephs in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Remember, his, remember, his brother sold him off into slavery. He ended up feeding them yep. because he became, you know, supervisor of Pharaoh's foods. Yep. But the same thing today, and it takes us forgiving. Because I ain't gonna lie, I ain't all that thrilled, you know, be linking up with somebody and your great great granddaddy might have sold mine. Because I'm coming to get my money, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's my initial thought, but I'm gonna see what you got to offer. But mm -hmm. in, in, in a more serious sense, Africa needs our technical expertise. Yes. yes. We have engineers, scientists, doctors, lawyers, judges. We, we, we have done everything in America and for us to be 13% of American population and yet to have, have the impact that we have had in everything from, from Neil deGrasse in astrophysics to Dr. Daniel Hale to even, even uh, uh, Ben Carson, you know, and his work in the medical field, because yeah, clearly yeah. he didn't know Jack yeah. about politics, uh, to, to our lawyers, uh, Catherine uh, Johnson, Marshall. Isn't that, isn't that her name? Catherine uh, Johnson, Catherine Johnson from uh, Hidden Figures. 
Catherine, isn't that, was that her first name? Those iconic women and hidden figures, you know, Charlotte Ray, the first black woman yes. lawyer, Maggie Walker, the first woman of any race to open a bank. We got to take that same expertise and, and build international bridges across the diaspora. And, and I just want to remind you, black people are all over the world. Anywhere yep. you go, there are black people. They are you us. might not see them in the, in, on, on Facebook, but they out there. The father of Russian literature was a black man. Mm -hmm. You know, the first king of Hawaii was a black man, King Kamehameha. Wow. Wow. Blacks been in China. Everything started in Africa. You know, we Africa, African, the African woman is the mother of civilization. Absolutely. Now, now what does um what does the title um I am Black Wall Street mean to you? I want kids to come away saying I am Black Wall Street. I want them to understand that if they can start, that they can start a business, they can be successful. And there are many, many examples to, to look at, to choose from, to build your own legacy on. I am Black Wall Street. I am an entrepreneur. I can succeed. You know, just like those Black people in Tulsa. If I live in Alaska, if I live in Alabama, in Alabama, you had, uh, 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 what's his name? Mr. Gaston, A.G. Gaston, I think it was, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Herman Russell in Baltimore. We had Tom Smith. And then years later, you had Willie Adams, you had Reginald F. Lewis, you had Isaac Myers over on the waterfront. DC had a Black Wall Street. Chicago had a Black Wall Street. It was called Bronzeville. Detroit had a Black Wall Street. It was called Black Bottom. Florida had Rosewood and a bunch of other Black towns. Uh, New York, you know, we talked about Tulsa. It was burned down in 1921. How many people knew that there was an original Black community in between 82nd and 89th Street in New York City in 1828. Wow. The slavery ended up north in 1804. So blacks up north were in the game quicker, sooner. Mm -hmm. right. While their cousins down south were enslaved, many of them. So yeah, Seneca Village in 1828 in Manhattan. In Brooklyn, you had Weeksville in 1835, independent black communities. You had Africville in Canada. Wherever there were black people, New Jersey, there's a place called Burlington Island, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That's called the cradle of emancipation. Ooh, okay. Burlington Island, New Jersey. So if you live in Baltimore in particular, there's so much black history that we need to know. And, and this black history, I assure you, will make you proud to be black because you're just not gonna get that type of empowering information in our schools, unfortunately. A lot of times teachers don't know. I went back to my fifth grade teacher after learning about Black Wall Street and my fifth grade teacher knew nothing about Black Wall Street. It wasn't, you know, so much is being uncovered and revealed. And I acknowledge that in my book, uh, the significance of social media uh -huh. bringing a lot of things to light things we didn't know we should have known i i now know things my dad didn't know but they did know that we better support each other that they did know mm -hmm. they might not have known the, the, the specifics of here and there but they did know that we have to work together yeah and and they understood that now do you think that do you think that uh, us in this modern day 21st century, do you think we get that yet? Some do, but you know, we're even more challenged because even more time has lapsed, you know, since integration, integration destroyed a lot yeah. of our fight. A lot of us got soft after the civil rights movement. Yeah. All we yeah. wanted to do was move to Randallstown, get a lawn, a picket fence, a car out front, you know, we were tired of seeing triggers, rats, and roaches. Now we got deer, bunny, rabbits, and foxes. Triggers, rats, and roaches. Wow, Donnie. I love that. And we, 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 we gave up the old neighborhood, like Santan. Right, right, right. We abandoned grandma's house. And guess who living in grandma's house now? Yeah. Yeah, definitely somebody. Guess who wants to buy grandma's house now? The house that we abandoned. And in many instances, 
because we don't have wills, because we don't have estate planning, we have lost significant property. I mean, we own more mm -hmm. properties, more property as a people 50 years ago. We got mm -hmm. better education during segregation. Yeah. How the hell you got 40% of your students in Baltimore City Public Schools with a 1.0 GPA? Come on now. Yeah, Somebody yeah. should be getting their hind parts whipped. And I don't mean the kids, I'm talking about right. adults. Yep. With all due respect, if it ain't about a sports, if it ain't about a ball game, if it ain't about the Emmy Awards, last night, I looked at the excitement of us as a people. I'm all for the Ravens. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't all that much for the Emmys, but I'm looking at America finds certain things palatable. As long as a black man is rapping, as long as a black man is telling jokes, as long as a black man is cheesing, as long as a black man looking feminine. Mm. These things are palatable to mainstream media. Right. And that's why I got my own Be More News because I don't find those things palatable. I find having an intellectual conversation with another black man about business and politics the most empowering thing that I possibly can do. Not throw a ball. I love, I love sports. But you know, too many people want to put it on us like that's all we know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We're far beyond sports. If you yeah. want to talk to me about sports, talk to me about Rube Foster, one of the icons in the Negro Leagues, who was about that paper, who's about that business. Mm -hmm. He was so much about it that they came and stole our black players from the Negro Leagues to play in their leagues because hey, even hockey, we were we were ice skating in Canada. In the 1800s, who you think invented back with skating? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Uh, you better teach him, Donnie. And, and see, this is this is like I said, why I enjoy having conversation about you because it's not it's not just about that book that 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 book that's behind you, I'm Black Wall Street, but it's about digging into what what was behind Black Wall Street, but also what we can do moving forward. Now I know you got to go too, um, but but I want you to one. Um, and you just talked about it. Um, how can well let's 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 do this. How can people connect with you to be able to buy the book from you? How can they get the book and even your other book, Unapologetically Black? Where can they go to, to be able to get it? Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Unapologetically Black by Donnie Glover. I am Black Wall Street by Donnie Glover, both available on Amazon and Noble, uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, I'm on social media, Donnie, D-O-N-I, Glover, all five, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to let you have the, the last word um, with, with this. If you can end it by just talking about, you talked about the kids understanding and come away with saying, I am Black Wall Street. Can you talk about the significance of that, us moving forward and understanding us being Black Wall Street? Right now, you see black women leading the way like never before. Yeah. Black Mayor Boston, uh, the black woman running the Greater Baltimore Urban League. Uh, you look at the black women in the Olympics, Shelley Ann Frazier Price, um, politics, medicine, the arts, law, black women are leading the way. Black women also control much of that one and a half, two trillion dollars that we have in annual disposable income. <laughs> For sure. If we can get more of our people to become aware of our buying power, mm -hmm. if we can invest more in property than in Burberry bags or mm -hmm. Louis Vuittons or things that actually have no real value, if we can get back to having our nucleus, our nuclear family, daddy, mommy, baby. Mm. If we can get back to just the basic things that our great grandparents and grandparents did so normally, so naturally, but now we got so many options. Back in the day, you had three options. You're gonna get blue jack with cells, black ones or white ones. <laughs> now we got all of these. Some people don't need all those options because they get confused and distracted. And so now you got people walking down the street or driving like this. Yeah. We're distracted. 
We got to get undistracted. We got to cut the phone off, cut the TV off. We got to get back to just talking to each other, eating together, enjoying mm. each other. COVID should have brought that home more than anything. You know, hey, Leroy, how you doing today? Just checking. It's Donnie. Just checking on. You. Hope you're right. doing well. Checking on our seniors. We got to get back to common sense. Uh, the old people said a fool and his money soon depart. Uh, we also know that another saying, beggars sitting on bags of gold. We have $2 trillion in annual disposable income. We have enough money to fund our own empowerment already. Mm. So yeah, we want the reparations, but we also got to manage what we already have because the good book says that if you're stored over little things, then God will make you stored over bigger things. So we got to get back. And I'm not a holy roller, biblical scholar, but there's some basic nuggets of common sense that we got to get back to. I love Morehouse, but if going to Morehouse is going to put me $150,000 in debt, I don't love it that much. Right. If I can go to BCCC and get a free two years and then go to COP and get another free two years, hey, I told my daughter, come out of college with no debt and a great credit score. Because this is America and that's what you judge by. Don't make my mistakes. We got to teach. See, a lot of us, we want to give our children things we never have. Give them the lessons you didn't learn. I love that. I love that. Give them the lessons that they didn't learn. That's powerful. And even us men, we got to step up. You yeah. know, when you go to college, you know, a young man thinks, I got to clock, I got to knock off 20 women. Right. We got to get back to teaching our sons. It's not how many women you've been with. It's how long you can stay with one. Yep. Absolutely. Just common sense, Leroy. And, and it really is, Donnie. Donnie, you know, I, I, I always enjoy these conversations that I, that, I, that I have with you because I always come away from these conversations learning so much more than what I knew before well, I had well, I, I just got a question for you, Leroy, because you know, I've been trained by the likes of David Miller where do I send my invoice to for this interview? Yeah. Oh, you go, you're gonna send it to to you're gonna send it to JNF Enterprises LLC. <laughs> I'm joking with that, but David reminds us all yep. this is business. Yep. Absolutely. What we do for each other, you you've certainly done services for me and and but we gotta get back to that. We gotta, yeah. I have to put a value on what you do. You help me get the electronic version of this. That, that's not what I do. So I had to give you whatever you want. And then likewise, and, and where we go wrong is, okay, you were there for me just before I published this. And so then when you call me a month, two months later, then all of a sudden I ain't gonna answer the phone. Oh, that's Leroy, I don't need him now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. We gotta get over that crud ball, yeah. petty, childish sucker. You know, we, we gotta stay sucker free. Yeah. And too much, too many of us. We I get what I want from you, and then yeah. all of a sudden I'm gonna start acting like a sucker. We gotta stay sucker free. Yeah. That man was there for you. That sister was there for you. You be there for them. You should. That's only the code, and that's yeah. what's lost in our society: the code and the respect. Yeah, and that, that's so true, Donnie. I mean, and and it's unfortunate where where we don't where we don't realize that we don't recognize that on the level that we that we need to there are plenty of us like you me and and i believe the people that are in our circles that understand that but there's so many more that just don't because like you said there are folks that that i've had that don't return your phone calls they they call you when they need you but you don't see them don't hear from them any other time that's and, wrong exactly and that's not that's that's bad karma. Yeah. So say, for whatever reason, I'm ignoring your phone call. That's going to leave you feeling a certain kind of way. Kind of way. Maybe you were like, hold up. I was there for brother when he needed me. He ain't taking my phone calls. But you got people like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I hope we do a better job recognizing if we did wrong, when we did wrong, because we all make mistakes acknowledge it to yourself, go back and apologize to that person, explain whatever, and fix it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't just kick over the, 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 the bucket of milk and play like you don't see it on the floor. You're a grown ass man. 
you know you knocked it over, go pick it up and clean it up. Yeah. People say they grown, but they ain't grown. No. And I've and I've I've learned that and, and I've learned that and you see that that folks wanna wanna act like they grown. But they Just really because don't. a woman can have a baby don't mean that she's grown. Don't Not mean yet. she's mature. I mean her body can can reproduce another baby, but does she really have the mentality, the spirit, the wisdom to be somebody's mother? And I ain't talking about age. Because right. you got some 60, 70 year old year old women out here that are more ratchet than these uh young ones. Yeah. And you yeah. got some old men out here who ain't learned nothing. The messed up three, four families and ready to mess up another one. Yeah. And that's the difference between um, a, a woman and a female and a man and a male. Like dudes walking around with their pants down. What's wrong yeah. with you, boy? You want somebody to poke you in your butt? What's that yeah. all about? You know, if, if they understood, you got your the, entire butt from. cheeks out there. You got yep. your entire butt cheeks, and don't even understand where that came from. Where Straight from came. the plantation. Yep. Come on now. Go oh. buck breaking. Yep. <laughs> You're resembling the worst thing any black wanted to see back in those days, mm. and you think it's. Sm- I saw a dude. He the pants was about a foot below his waist, but he had his belt around his thighs to hold wow. the pants up, and it's like. Yeah, yeah, but that's the men- that's a that's a mentality and it's a mindset. We totally gotta opposite think for ourselves, of, man. Yeah, totally. That's opposite what I want. I want us to think for ourselves. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, it's, and that's totally opposite from a Black Wall Street mindset. You know, the black people went out there. Man, can you imagine being? Listen, this is the 1800s. Yep. So here's a quick fact. You ever heard of the Lone Ranger? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. That story was based on a black man. Yes. Yeah. Fast Reeves. Uh huh. So them black people out in Oklahoma in the 1800s, 1840, Civil War, 1865, that was the wild, wild west, bro. Yeah. And everybody out in Oklahoma got a gun. Everybody in Texas got a gun. So, you know, it was, these were gangsters, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. And the Absolutely. women could shoot too. Yeah. Don't forget stagecoach Mary, first woman on the Pony Express. Mail carrier. Mm. Now, see, this is why y'all need to go out and get this book. I am Black Wall Street. I am Black Wall Street. Donnie, where can it be found again? Where can folks go get Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Thank you, Leroy, for the opportunity. Again, the foreword was done by noted attorney, former judge William Billy Murphy Jr. Yeah. I was really fortunate to have that. He's such a genius. I don't know if you've ever sat and talked with him, uh, but he's, you, you need to interview Billy Murphy. Mm. Oh, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'd love to. Well, I'd well love I'll to. do what I can to help make that happen. He just built a wonderful studio. He's, Did he? oh, keeping, okay. it, he's keeping it hush hush, but I can't wait to get at it because I want to get yeah. all up in that studio. <laughs> Thank you for what you do, Leroy. And you help a lot of authors. Uh, and let me recommend if you are trying to get your book to. Oh, you hit your mute, you hit your mute button, Don. If you're Thank trying you. to get your book to market, call Leroy. Leroy <laughs> McKenna. Thanks a lot. I, I can be reached at 443 858 2684. What's your phone number, Leroy? Yeah, 443. 443- Seven six two two three two four, and you all you definitely want to tune in to bemorenews.com. Donnie, tell them when they when they can see your when they can see your show too before we go. Oh, we have broadcast. So back in December, we launched Black USA because COVID is going to do one of two things: it's going to make you fall back, or it's going to make you go forward. Standing still is going backwards. So COVID has put everybody in the situation. You're going to go forward or you're going to fail. And I choose to go forward. So we've been always wanting to do a national website, blackusa.news, the voice of our people. That came about around December. And since then, we've created programming seven days a week, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, 7 p.m. We got different shows, uh, Saturday at 10 a.m., Sunday at 6 p.m. Long story short, we have programming seven days a week including programming two shows from uh, Oakland and the East Bay area in California, one show from New York. I'm working on a show from uh, 
Chicago. Oh, cool. and, and we're open to anybody else's show. I mean, you know, I tried to recruit you, but you already got a home, so I don't know. <laughs> but now, is that the YouTube channel too? Because I know you're, you're on YouTube. Yeah, we, that, well, we, we broadcast YouTube? on YouTube, Donnie Glover, and then also on uh, Facebook.com slash Black USA News. The news before the news, y'all. Mr. Donnie Glover, well, you know, I appreciate you. I uh, thank you for all that you do uh, in, in Baltimore, not just in Baltimore, but, but as the country and the diaspora as a whole. Um, it's, yeah, it's I, I forgot to tell you, we, we've given away over 1,800 Black Wall Street Awards in the past yes. 10 years. Yes. Uh, New York, we're going to Harlem on all of that to say we have an awards on Wednesday. You can go to Black Wall Street Central City .com. That's Black Wall Street Central City .com. And we got a smaller venue up in Harlem. Uh, if you want the information, you can call me. We're not doing a mass broadcast because we're trying to keep it tight. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I ain't trying to catch COVID in New York, Baltimore, wherever. <laughs> but you can call me at 443-858-2684. Shout out to Mr. Vito Jones up in Harlem. Uh, yeah, a lot of people. We love New York. I love Atlanta, too. We, we've done the most Black Wall Street Awards in both of those cities. Atlanta and in uh, New York City. Our first event was in New York at the United Nations, so we're not playing oh. with them. Oh wow! Oh, okay, so ten years ago, it's not a game. We're dead serious. Absolutely, and and if you haven't been a part of those the the awards banquet that he's had, it is it is a true honor to be a part of that and, and to see the other businesses that are a part that have been honored. And, and a part of Black Wall Street because it's serious. Like Donnie said, this is not a game, y'all. This is not a game and, and we're, we're serious about it. So we wanna thank y'all for tuning in to another episode of the Office Showcase. You can actually go get your subscription to the National Black Unity News at www.tnbun.com. We want you to subscribe. We want you to get your copy of the newspaper. You can get your current issue of the newspaper, which which has, you can see behind me, which has uh, Donnie and the other authors that are part of uh, this this um, this particular um, issue of the newspaper uh, in, in there. You'll be able to have it. So much more information that's in there as well, too. My name is Leroy McKenzie Jr., the Impact Builder. As I always say, we're in 2021, you all, and it's about, it's about leaving the familiar to elevate your influence. And what better way to elevate your influence by elevating your mind and elevating your, the, your knowledge that you have by reading a book, by getting yourself a book like I Am Black Wall Street. I Am Black Wall Street. I Am Black Wall Street. We wanna thank y'all for tuning in. We will see you all next time. Thank you and we'll talk to you all soon. Power to the people.